So our Father in heaven, we look to you as our Savior and as our God, and thank you for putting the Holy Spirit inside of us to lead us into all truth, your word of truth. So we do pray that today, Lord, that we will know your word, that it will impact our hearts, and that we will glory in the love and the mercy and the grace and the kindness and the patience that you have shown to us. And we give you all the praise and we glorify your name and thank you, Lord, that we have the Bible available to us, that we can study it and learn and listen to you. So focus our minds and our thoughts upon the truths before us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, your wonderful son, amen. So uh, our scripture today is in the book of Romans, chapter two, We're all the way to chapter two now. And the first five verses, uh, we can take a moment and read those. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So in our message last week, we looked at a big list of sin, sins and sinners. My goodness, what a list that is. In chapter 1, like in verse 28 and 29, uh, they're filled, I mean, just filled with all manner of unrighteousness and evil and covetousness and malice. They're full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and maliciousness. Would you like to live in a neighborhood like that? It, maybe Chicago's like that. <laughs> Keep hearing stuff about that city. These people are gossipers. They're slanders. They hate God. They're insolent, they're haughty, they're boastful, they're in inventors of evil. They're disobedient to parents. They're foolish and faithless and heartless and ruthless. And they know that God's righteous decree that says everybody that practices a thing like this, they deserve to die. And they not only do these things, they give approval to everybody that does them. Does that sound like our world today? They're forcing everybody to approve who sins. And if you don't approve who sins, they're going to punish you somehow. Uh, different states in our own country, and different countries are, are even farther along than this, of making it a hate crime, a, a new crime that they've developed in the last few years. A hate crime is when... Um, I read the Bible in Genesis 1 that says, in the beginning God made them male and female. And that God says the male and the female should get married. Well, if it makes a person feel bad that doesn't believe that, that they think that if they're male, they can become a female and vice versa. They think that a male and a male can get married or female and female. So if I read contrary to their beliefs and it makes them feel bad, they can go to the police and say, listen to his sermon. It made me feel bad and it hurt me inside. And the police will come and arrest me for doing a hate crime. That's happening today. We have uh, close to that in our own state. This is happening all over the world because it's Satan motivating people to turn against Christians and turn against Christian telling the truth because he spreads lies and deceptions. He does not want the truth told, so he's going to punish the truth tellers. 
Hmm. This scripture is about the judgment of God. Uh, Bob Dylan wrote a Christian song a few decades ago, uh, and it was called A Slow Train Coming. It's a coming around the bend. That's a slow train of God's judgment. You can feel the rumble a little bit, and you can hear the whistle and hear those big engines coming, but you can't see it yet. But it's coming. It'll get there. Eventually, it's, it'll be there. And that's how the judgment of God is coming upon this whole world and the seven-year tribulation time. It's coming, and it will eventually show up and be here. God's wrath. There'll be a time when, when the whole world is gathered together by the Antichrist to come to the Jerusalem and try to attack Jerusalem. And Jesus Christ himself lands on the Mount of Olives with angels and flaming fire and all of the saints in gleaming white to do battle with all of the nation's armies and the beast and the false prophet. And in his wrath, he will defeat them all and it won't even be a battle. He captures the beast and the false prophet and hurls them into the lake of fire and the rest of them, Jesus speaks a word and they're all dead. The time of his wrath is coming upon this world. The evil is growing every day. Uh, the leaders in this world are more bold and brazen and they're getting away with more. We see innocent people punished and we see the so clearly guilty people go free. But through it all, this passage talking about the judgment of Christ, there is one question that every human being has to answer before the human being dies and leaves this earth. It's the most important question. It's more important than family. It's more important than voting for a Republican or voting for a Democrat. It's more important than getting food. It's more important than what job we have or where we go to school or any other decision we have in this life. It's where we spend eternity. We're here for a short time. <coughs> Maybe 70, 80 years. Maybe we'll live to be 100. I heard about a person that was almost 100. When she was 99, you know, they would sing happy birthday and they would say, and many more, and she would say, oh, I hope not. <laughs> Her body really alien and old, you know, just hurting. I, I want out of this body. You know, believe her, she's going to get a new one someday. But we need to know where we're going to spend eternity. If we spend 100 years here, we're going to be 100 billion, zillion, quadrillion years. It'll never end. And consciousness never end. For a believer, we'll be with Jesus in the new Jerusalem and the most glorious thing we can, far beyond what we can even imagine. He's, he's tried to show us some. A city made out of jewels and gold with God himself lighting the whole thing. You don't need an ocean. You don't need a sun and moon. Wow. But the other people, the ones that are kept out of that city will be in a lake that burns with fire and sulfur forever and ever. As a kid, we used to take sulfur from our chemistry set and put it in a spoon and hold it over a candle, and then it would melt, and then it would get all liquidy, and it would be, have this little blue flame, and it smelled like rotten eggs. You could only stand that so long. But I couldn't imagine being in a lake of that forever, paying for your own sin. The Bible says that God loves us so much that he sent his son to be our savior from that. In the beginning, God said, don't eat of that tree. If you eat of that tree of knowledge of good and evil, you're going to die. And Satan told Eve, no, you won't. We live in a time when more and more people are believing that Satan is the good guy and God is the bad guy. That God tried to keep human race from something. Satan says, oh, you'll be like God's and you won't die. God's a big meanie. It's real easy to tell who was telling the truth and who we want to listen to. 
God says, eat of that tree, you'll die. Satan says, no, you won't. So who do I want to listen to? I just need to look at this. My grandparents are dead. My parents are dead. Guess what? Everybody dies. Who was telling the truth? God was telling the truth. Satan's a liar. He lies to you, then he hurts you. And that's what this, this world government, this whole thing, the world church, everything, is led by Satan to uh, lead his whole world into world domination, just as the Bible predicted and said. It's happening exactly as God said. They're starting to follow Satan instead of God. But we follow God. We follow the truth. We know where we're going to be because Jesus died for us, and he, he's there now. He rose and ascended. The Bible says in John 3, 36, Whoever believes in his Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The wrath of God remains on every person that is born into this world unless they believe that Jesus Christ, his Son, is the only Savior. And the world truly does not want to hear that. The one world religion does not want to hear that. It's not allowed. Every religion is good and needs to be included. And no one religion can say we're the only one. Well, the creator God says he is the only one. And his son is the only one. His only begotten son died for us. So this passage, instead of pointing out all these horrible sins, which anybody could look at them and say, man, you deserve to die doing sins like that. That's certainly what God says. Well, this next group of people, they don't have sins like that. They're really good. They don't do anything wrong, not like those people. They, they're so good, they can look at those people and say, see, look at that. Oh, thank God I'm not like that. Oh, they're so terrible. I had a, uh, just a real revelation when I was first saved. Uh, I spent time in juvenile hall. My neighbor's parents didn't want me to play with their kids. I got bad stories and remembrances about that. And uh, in my teenage years, I was uh, somewhat of a bad kid. And when I got saved, I thought, I am a sinner. The pastor said, you believe you're a sinner? And I said, oh, man. Let me tell you, I'm a hippie. Drugs, sex, and rock and roll. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a sinner. But I thought everybody else in the world wasn't. They weren't as bad like I was. And one day I had an occasion to go uh, downtown. I forget what government office. It was a government office. I had to go there for some reason. And I was looking at all the people sitting at the desks and all nice, responsible people having a job, working, all looked good and Nobody had long hair like I had and all this stuff. And, I, and the thought came to me, you know, I'm learning the Bible. And the Bible says that everybody's a sinner. That means all these people are too. They don't look like it, but they really are. And, and unless they believe on the Son, they'll be in hell just like I would have been, being a really bad sinner. Everybody's a sinner, even the good, seemingly good people. Somebody said, I don't think the Lord's coming very soon because it says, as it was in the days of Noah, where everybody had wicked thoughts and violence was everywhere. And it's not like that. You know, if you're break down on the side of the road and somebody's going to stop and say, can I help you? There's good people. And I said, you know, that's true. But let a catastrophe like all the power goes out or something happen for a few weeks when there's no food and no more available food. And the, the man's little kids are crying, Daddy, I'm hungry. I read the Donner Party. They ate each other. They, they were good people, hardworking American people, but when there was no food, they ate each other. And you hear lots of stories, plane crashes, and. Uh, nobody can get to them for weeks. Just see what happens to the world if the power is shut off all over the whole country or the whole world all at once. You're going to see a lot of people that you thought were good turn out to be pretty bad. 
But now God looks at the heart of everybody, and he sees how we really are. He knows all of our thoughts. You know, I've heard a pastor say, if I put, you know, you, for instance, I could point there because nobody's there. If I took you, for instance, and put all your thoughts up on the screen for the whole, yeah, I mean, just maybe 10 minutes of your thoughts, put them on the screen, nobody in here would want to sit next to you anymore. <laughs> Yeah, and, and then I heard a pastor say, if I put my thoughts as the pastor on the screen, you probably wouldn't want me to be your pastor anymore. God knows all the thoughts. He knows everything going on inside of us. And there's people that say, look at them, and I, I don't have that problem. Jesus talked to people like that. In, in this message today, we're going to look at the self-righteous judge, and that's who they are. They're self-righteous judges of others. They don't think God's going to judge them. And, and then we're going to look at the kind, patient, forbearing judge. God is the judge, but he's kind, patient, forbearing. Then we're going to look at the righteous judge that he is. Judgment is coming, and it's according to his righteousness and standards, not ours. But these people are self-righteous. It begins, therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, because you judge, pass judgment on other people, and you say, look at them, but inside you're doing the same thing. My goodness. You know, we look up to, to movie stars, and we see them in movies, like an actor that always plays a good guy. And then all of a sudden, he's divorcing his wife, and his wife is out there blabbing, telling him what he's really like. We go, oh, my goodness, we didn't see that. <laughs> because we put on a persona. You know, kind of sometimes we put on a mask when we come into church. It'd be interesting to hear the conversations in people's cars as they're coming to church. <laughs> and, um, and then... Maybe things weren't going so well in the car on the way to church, but they get there. How are you today? I'm great. <laughs> oh, I don't want to tell you what just argument we just had. I've given you these things out of personal experience. So, yeah. Jesus talked about people that look different on the outside than they do in the inside. Uh, in Matthew uh, 23. He's talking to some Pharisees and he's given a whole bunch of woes to them in chapter 23. But in verse 27, he says to these scribes and Pharisees, he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. That's what he calls them. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly you, they appear as beautiful, but inside they're full of dead people's bones and everything unclean. It smells. It's wrecked. It's terrible. So you also outwardly, you appear righteous to others, but within you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and you decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we have lived in the days of our fathers, we wouldn't have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witnesses, uh, you're witnessing against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore, I send you the prophets and the wise men and the scribes, some of whom you will kill and you will crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of the righteous, from Abel and the blood of Zechariah, the son of Bechariah, whom he you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. <laughs> you look so nice on the outside. He talked about how they love to pray in public, and everybody goes, wow. Wow, what a man. But he knows what's going on inside. So he's just saying, they're self-righteous people. They don't appear to be these terrible sinners. 
but inside they really are. And they are going to be judged. God's uh, judgment is coming upon this world. There's going to be turmoil in this world. Despite what the, U the UN uh, says, they said we need to form a united nations of all the world to end all the wars in the world. There'll be no more wars once we're in charge. And I guess I I've read that there's been more wars since they've been in charge than has ever been. And there's going to be more, J Jesus said, there's going to be wars all the way till the end. And there's a time when there's great turmoil in this world and this church is taken away and this ruler of the Antichrist, the lawless one, the beast, and when he comes and signs a treaty with Israel, people will say, there is peace and security. Oh, finally. But then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. The next seven years, they will not be able to escape unless they trust in Christ as their Savior and are taken out of this world. There is the wrath of God coming. Hebrews 9.27 says, Just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. When we die, we're going to be judged. Jesus calls sick people Sinners to repentance. In Luke 5, uh, the time when Matthew, the, the, who wrote the book of Matthew, an apostle, when Jesus called him. He went to his house for dinner with a lot of other people that Matthew associated with who were all sinners. And the Pharisees saw it and they don't, didn't like it. <laughs> So Matthew 5.27, after this he went out and he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and he followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And when the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I've known some really good people. I worked with a guy in Lake Tahoe for many years. Every time I tried to talk to him about the Lord, he reminded me, I don't want to hear it. How many swear words did I hear from this guy? We worked in security where we were getting fights with people and roll around on the floor trying to handcuff people. And How many swear words? Never a swear word. The, the story was, if there was a bad guy and you sent Mitch and this other guy there, they would probably buy him dinner. <laughs> You know, we were nice guys. But I was a Christian, and he wasn't. And a lot of times he acted better than I did. He was a kind, loving man. He was a good man. He still is. He's a good man. I have a lot of respect for him. But he doesn't know the Lord. He doesn't want to. He's not sick. He doesn't need to. And, and Jesus says, I only fix sick people. All the sick people came to him and he healed them. How about the ones that needed to be saved? He said, I'll, I'll save you if you know you're sick. But if you don't know you're sick, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And, and that's where a lot of self-righteous people are. That's where they are. They're, I don't need a savior. We have all the money. We have good jobs. We have a retirement. We have everything. We're good. We serve in the community. All our kids are playing all the sports and no, we don't need a savior. They do. They need to know that they're really sick. They're self-righteous. And they, and they do judge other people. And they say, do you think you're going to escape the judgment of God? You need to see yourself as God sees you. And then you'll change your mind. He came to call sinners to repentance, 
not the, not the good people, not the righteous. They're not really righteous. They just think they are. So this God, th these people are judges and they're judging others, but God is going to judge them. And then there's God the judge in verse 4. And these people presume on that. They count it as really nothing. They, they don't like it. Do you presume on the riches of his kindness? Oh, the judge, our judge is kind. Not only kind, he has riches of kindness. He has a wealth of kindness. You know, wouldn't it be so, what it would it be like to be so rich? Um, uh, when my son was little, I used to take him to, into the Ferrari dealer in Sacramento. And they'd always have other used cars. They had Lamborghinis and all these exotic cars and the new Ferraris in there. Wouldn't it be nice to, to walk in there on Monday and say, hey, I'd like to buy that one and here's the cash for it. You know, and then Tuesday walk in and say, my son really wants that one. He can't drive yet, but I'm going to let him play with it, you know. And then uh, Wednesday you say, well, my wife has always dreamed of having a, you know, a Bugatti. And so I see you got a new Bugatti. I'd like to buy that one. Here's the money for that. And uh, I read about a sailboat, a guy's personal sailboat. The mast was so tall, it couldn't fit under the Golden Gate Bridge. And the keel on it was so deep, it also couldn't fit in the water. It was too deep for the San Francisco Bay. It was a big sailboat, you know, a few hundred feet long. You could live on it. Your whole family and extended family could live on it. People just have oodles of money. How much when the Bible says that God has riches of kindness, it's like that. It's just so much. How much do you need? He's got way more kindness than you need. Everything that I need, he has. He is so kind. To be kind is, is a quality of being helpful or beneficial. Our judge is helpful and beneficial. He has goodness in him. He has generosity. This is what this word means. The Most High is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Even while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. If you indeed have tasted that the Lord is good, he is kind. In the coming ages, that he's going to show us the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. I can imagine uh, some poor person in the world that has nothing. They have no house and their, their kitchen is a hole in the ground and they try to find sticks to heat up their food and they're starving. They're watching their kids starve. And then some wealthy man comes and, and takes them out of there and, and brings them to London and gives them the best clothes and flies them around the world and says, here's 10 houses around the world I'm going to give you. And, and they would say, well, why are you doing this for us? We don't deserve this. And he said, I'm just kind. I, I love to do this for people. And this verse in Ephesians is saying throughout all eternity, God is going to keep showing us things that he's given to us and done for us. When we see this magnificent city, uh, the new Jerusalem come down out of heaven from God, made out of gold and gems and pearls. A and we can live there forever and we never have to eat, but we can if we want. And, and we never grow old. And we never get tired. And he says, you can live here forever. A and we're going to keep saying, oh, the riches of your grace and your kindness. I don't deserve this. Thank you, God, for giving so much to me. All the coming ages, we're going to be saying that. The riches of his grace, the riches of his glory, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, the forgiveness of sins he gives us, all according to the riches of his grace, the riches of his glorious inheritance that we have in the saints. He preaches to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Everything that we don't deserve, he gives us. And man, it's just in abundance. He'll never run out. In Titus, 
chapter 3, it says this. Don't, um, for we ourselves were once foolish before we were saved. We're not foolish now. <laughs> for we were once foolish. We were once disobedient. We were led astray. We were slaves to various passions and pleasures and passing our days in malice and envy. We were hated by other people and, and all the people were hating each other. That sounds very familiar. But, here's a big but. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. And not in works of righteousness that we've done in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. We're justified by his grace so we can become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Also mired in sin, so seemingly unsavable, but then God comes in with his riches of his loving kindness and mercy and grace and saves us. What a great God we have. That's our judge. That's what God wants us to know. And then he, he offers forbearance to us. It's clemency. It's tolerance. It's used only one more time in Romans 3.26. <clears throat> in his divine forbearance, he has passed over our former sins. <clears throat> Thank God. I need my sins to be passed over by him, forgiven by him, wiped out. And then he's patient with us. He puts up with us. And Paul is a shining example of that. Uh, in 1 Timothy, uh, he's talking about himself and his life and his salvation experience. He's giving his testimony. And he says this, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me into his service. But formerly, I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was an insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I acted in ignorantly in an unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy, and it deserves full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he says, of whom I am foremost. He saw himself as the worst of all sinners because he persecuted the church of God. And then he says, but I received mercy for this reason that in me, the foremost, the very worst, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who believe in him for eternal life. God chose Paul before he was born to be this messenger to the Gentiles of the world and the writer of Scripture to proclaim that the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says in Galatians 1.15, he says, God set me apart before I was born. Well, how come it took all the way through his childhood and his teenage years, Timothy accepted Christ when he was a child? His mother and grandmother read him the scriptures. Hey, but then Paul went through his teenage years. He became a Pharisee. And when Christ came and the disciples were being made, he felt that they were wrong and they weren't true. So he went after them to kill them. He arrested them. He put them into prison. He tortured them. Then he killed them. And, and when was going to finally come the time when he would be out there preaching to, to the world about Christ instead of killing people that believe in Christ? He said, God was patient all the way through my whole life. He chose me for this work, but I went so far, and I was so evil and wrong and hurtful. God is patient. And he says, I want 
my life to be an example to everyone that trusts in Christ. God is going to be patient until you come and trust him as your Savior. And even people that know him as their Savior spend part of their life not living for him, away from him. God is patient, and he will bring us back to him and make us be fruitful uh, believers in his service. He's patient. God, Paul says, just look at my life. I was chosen to be a man of God, and I ended up being a man of the devil. It, it took into adulthood, and God was patiently waiting for me. Of course, Paul had a big event where God appeared, Jesus appeared before him in blinding light and all of his glory, and Paul went blind. And, and from that point, he said, I'm following Christ. I know now he's real. I saw him risen from the dead in all of his glory. But he said, my whole life is meant to be an example. Never give up on praying for people. Never give up that thinking God is done with you. I have a very good friend who came to Christ where I worked. And golly, that was... Uh, back in uh, the early 2000s. And, and I said, you know, my, I feel like I've missed it. You know, I've messed it. I missed it and I messed it. And I think God is done with me. And he said, no, he's not. And then he was a new Christian. And he, he said, you told me about Christ. I never would have heard about Christ if it wasn't for you. And, and then he said, I read about Caleb. You're not 80 yet. <laughs> so... God's using him. He said, I can go out and do battle just like I was as a young man. And he said, God is still going to use you. And every once in a while reminds me of that. <laughs> said, you're right. God is patient with us. He's a patient God. That's who he is. Doesn't okay sin ever, ever, but he's a patient God. God's patience waited in the days of Noah. God told Noah, I want you to build a boat. And it was 120 years later of Noah preaching to people. He preached and, and the ark had to be made. But he still, God was patient. He gave them 120 years. The patience of our Lord counted as salvation. God is slow He's not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. He's patient towards you. He doesn't wish that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. There is the church, and he's building his church. He's adding people to it. He's growing the people in it, maturing the people in it. And when that church is finally complete, when the last person is put into it, he's patient until that moment. I, and I think, my goodness, how far are we going to get into this new world order where we, don't, we see on the horizon where they can make everything we believe in the Bible a crime, and they're already doing it. We can see in other countries where Christians are being slaughtered and imprisoned. And it hasn't come here yet, but it's, it's on its way. God is patient, waiting for people to be saved. Boy, Spread the good news. Spread the gospel. Tell people that Jesus loved them and sent his son to die so we can be saved. Maybe that will be the final person. <laughs> and God will call his church home. Oh, the kindness of his goodness. It's all meant to lead us to repentance. And the people, they presume upon that. The ones that are righteous, they scorn it. They treat it with contempt. They despise it. Oh, God is kind and he's patient and forbearing. That doesn't apply to me. I don't even need him. Oh, boy, everybody needs him. Every, he needs to be the savior of everyone. And in verse 5, oh, he is the judge and he will judge. And he's going to. Uh, the, the day of judgment is coming. He's judging I believe the whole world right now, even America, uh, the sin is taking over, the, the amount of babies that have been murdered, the amount of pornography that goes out every day and is watched, and uh, the, the amount of greed, men love themselves and they love money. 
Uh, most people don't want anything to do with God, don't know him. Even in churches, there's people that are going to church, but they don't know him really. I think that I'm sure of it, that um, there's going to be some churches when the Lord does come, and they'll be all asking the pastor that's still there and all the people are still there, what, what was this that happened? And they'll say, well, I don't know. You've got to go on CNN and find out because <laughs> they'll tell us for sure. And, and all these news stations, they, every morning they say, what you need to know for the day. And I guess they'll have that too, what you need to know for the day now that all these space aliens have taken all these bad people away <laughs> or whatever's going to happen. However, they're going to explain the rapture. But this judge, he is coming. And, and why don't people respond to his mercy? It says in verse 5, because their heart is hard. They don't have a soft heart, a receptive heart. And that word hard means actual hard things. Their heart has actually become hard. And God's word can't get into it. And, and God said, my kindness should lead you to repentance. But they're impenitent. They have no repentance and they're not going to. So their wrath has been stored up like a treasure. You know, we, we want to build our bank accounts. We put money into them. I guess that's how it used to work anyway. We put money into it and every month it grows bigger. Our retirement accounts are supposed to get bigger. It's our treasure. And, well, these people are not, they're, they're building a treasure of sin. It's just heaping up and higher and higher. They're storing it up for the day of God's wrath when his wrath comes. And boy, it's coming like this world has never seen. In 2 Thessalonians, boy, it, it describes a very scary uh, situation. Uh, the people in Thessalonica were persecuted. And Paul said, don't worry, the ones persecuting you, they will experience my wrath. And in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, it says, when the Lord Jesus, when he's revealed from heaven, and when he's revealed from heaven, this is at the end of the tribulation, at the battle of Armageddon, he has mighty angels with him. And he's coming in flaming fire. And he's inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they're going to suffer punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at all who have believed on him, hmm, we're going to marvel at him, but the world is going to cringe in fear and terror and tears and screaming. <coughs> because his wrath is coming upon this world. Revelation 19 talks about that final battle when Christ comes and all the world's armies and he takes care of them in no time at all and that he sets up his eternal kingdom. It's good to know that God is a merciful and good God. In Exodus chapter 33, when the people of Israel were led out of Egypt, they went through the Red Sea where it parted. It destroyed the army of the Egyptians that were after them. And Moses is very concerned that God is going to go with them. And he, he says, God, if you're not going to go with me, I don't want to go. <laughs> and in verse 12 of Exodus 33, he says to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. And you have said, I know you by name. And you have found favor in my sight. He knew Moses. He, Moses found favor in his sight. He says, now if I have found favor in your sight, please, please show me your ways. He says, God, I want to know all about you. And I want to know you in order to find favor in your sight. That's a good prayer for any of us. Say, God, I want to know your ways. I want to know what you like and what you don't like and how you are and 
how you want me to be. I want to know you. And consider, too, that this nation of your people, and you said, and God says to him, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And Moses says to God, I want to see your glory. I really want to see you. And in 18, verse 18, he says, please show me your glory. And God says to him, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And, it will be, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for a man shall not see me and live. If, he, if Moses saw God's face, he would have died. So the Lord says, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And then will I take my, away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So in verse 4, of chapter 34, Moses cut the two tablets of stone. He goes up on the mountain. The Lord descended in a cloud, and he stood with him there, and he proclaimed the name of the Lord, and the Lord passed before him. And this is what God said to him. Did he say, oh, I'm the righteous judge, and, and anybody that doesn't know me, I'm going to kill them? What is this message that God the judge says to Moses, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. That's how he wants us to know him. Do you ever get condemned when you do something wrong? Or condemned when you don't do anything wrong? <laughs> the devil is just always, in our sinful nature too, it's just always accusing us. And I find myself arguing with my sinful nature of the devil. And all day long I have to say, Start, stop arguing with the devil. <laughs> Look at what God says. He forgives all of my sin, all of it. Christ bore it all on the cross. Well, this was Moses in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, what is there for us as the church people? Well, Hebrews chapter 4. When Moses met God in this cleft of the rock and he was right in God's presence, we can go into God's presence every time we pray. We're going into the throne room in heaven. Hebrews 4.14 since we have a great high priest. Jesus is a high priest. And he passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Oh, you know, believe these things, they're true. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. And yet without sin, he was tempted in every way. The devil came to him and took him up on a mountain and took him here and took him there and tempted Jesus in every way. And Jesus had no sin. He knows what it's like to be tempted by the devil in person. And he says, therefore, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. His throne is called grace, giving us the benefit of being in the presence of God right in his throne room. Something we don't deserve and something we couldn't earn. It's all because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And with that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So my prayer goes up to God. And my, it's right in the throne room of God. And I say, God, I need help right now. And, and, and this week, more than a lot of weeks, I've been crying to God. God, I need help. I need you to reassure me. I need to show me the truth of your word, please. And, and God says, of course, this is, this is what you have as a Christian. Come to me anytime. 
and pray to me. Tell me what you need. And, and I'm gracious and I'm merciful and I'm kind. I'll listen to you and I'll answer you. I'm going to help you. Oh, God, there's, there's nothing else better in the world than that. And when people say they don't want Christ, I don't get it. I still don't. I mean, I know why. Their, hearts and, their minds and hearts are blinded by Satan. They, they do belong to Satan. And it's only when the light of Jesus Christ comes in and the, and the gospel, they respond to it, they can be saved. And all of the darkness falls away. But to be able to go to God at any time and say, God, I need your help. I don't, deserve, I don't deserve to be in your presence, but because you're a gracious, merciful, kind God, I can be. Thank you, and please help me. <sighs> Who wouldn't want that? I don't know. But I'm glad that I have it because I trust in Christ as my Savior. Any of us that trust in Christ as our Savior, we can come right to him. Praise God. He's a good God. He's merciful. He's kind. He's gracious. Tell the whole world that. Everybody needs to know because they feel so condemned by Christians. We're just out there trying to ruin their party. No, we're not. We're trying to tell them about the good and gracious and loving God who died on the cross for their sins. And that's what we're going to share in communion time. But we're going to sing a song first. We played it once. The words are in the bulletin. It's called, It is Finished. When Christ was on the cross, he cried out, It is finished. Uh, the first part of that song, the words are spoken. And then uh, it's a quartet. And one of the quartet starts to sing. And he said, I didn't know that the war had been already won. <laughs> By Christ, I would try to fight all my own battles. And I was losing. It was too hard. I felt like a prisoner of war. I'm captured here. And then I finally, God finally broke through that he fought all my battles for me. And now I'm free. I listen to this song all the time. We're going to listen to it now. And this time we have the words. But it is a powerful song, and they sing it powerfully. So we're ready, Mason.